Hi, I'm Michael Famner, the BIM manager with WHW Architects. I've been there for about four years. Before that, um, I'm from Chicago. I've been using Revit starting there for about for over 10 years now. Um, and this is Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Sampson. I am an architect at WHW Architects. I've been there for a bit over four years and uh, got involved using BIM when Mike was brought on as the BIM manager. So started off with some BIM training probably about four months in, and I've been using uh, Revit as our uh, BIM tool pretty much almost exclusively since. I have to do a little bit of work uh, in CAD also. Um, I am the uh, project manager on the NSLC projects for uh, WHW. Uh, we have some NSLC projects within our office and we chose one of them to be our case study today. Uh, WHW Architects, we've been around for a while. This is our, our breakdown right here. The office does uh, a lot of institutional projects, so um, within the education sector, um, some university projects. We do healthcare, uh, rec centers, and uh, some commercial retail and some residential. Uh, we're using Revit or, uh, and, uh, or BIM within all of those industries, probably actually the least within our retail, so um, this was a, a good example of, of how we're moving some of the uh, retail projects into uh, BIM as well. Definitely a work in progress kind of situation. Yes, Mike's next link that. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna do that. So the uh, project that we chose as our case study today is the NSLC uh, Forest Hills project, and the reason we chose this one is it's, it's a good compact project where we actually have uh, full integration of BIM within uh, architectural, structural, mechanical, electrical, uh, and civil. Uh, our project team here, or this project, is ourselves WSW Architects. We worked with CBCL for structural, mechanical, and electrical. Jeff right here up front is our structural engineer on this project from CBCL, and Genevar uh, for our civil engineering as well as some of the geotechnical and planning services on it. So we're gonna dive right into our case study right here. Uh, the NSLC Forest Hills project uh, is a new project. Actually, bid just closed yesterday, so that's where we're at uh, in the process. Uh, it's replacing an existing retail unit, which you guys can see right there. It's been around for a while, so this is actually one of the highest grossing stores in the province. So one of the reasons for um, putting in a, a brand new store, upgraded store, the NSLC is actually um, upgrading a lot of their um, stores, of course, to have the big beer fridges and cool zones, and this one right now doesn't have refrigerated beer in it, and that's one of the highest grossing stores. That's just not flying right now, so that's, uh, that's what's one of the big motivators for this project here. It's around 10,000 square feet, the, the project, uh, which was limited because of um, some of the land use bylaws in there. If we went more than 10,000 square feet, uh, we were going to have to go into uh, the development permit process, and actually it's targeting lead uh, for new construction, a silver tar is our target right now. All the NSLC projects are uh, registered uh, for in the lead program and are targeting. Most of them lead silver, some of them actually for, um, for commercial interiors lead gold. So this is the, uh, just a little breakdown of the building construction. You can see Jeff's st structural model here shown on this image. It's a steel frame construction. Uh, with steel stud infill with oak board insulation and the materials that we're using on the exterior corrugated steel siding. We've got some wood siding, um, some stone and glazed curtain wall, which are uh, pretty much the standard materials that we're using on some of the, or on most of the new NSLC projects. And we just, we put this one up here right now just to, I think it's important to make the point that uh, this is a, a, a retail client that does change its interior package from project to project based on the location that uh, we are designing for. So uh, in this case, we're going with a Distinctly Maritimes package um, where we're drawing inspiration from just up over the concrete hill, the beauty of the uh, Lawrencetown Beach. So as opposed to some of our retail projects that we do where we're basically rolling out the same interior scheme, we actually do change it up on, on uh, each project here. Uh, we have, I guess, a few unique features in this project, or at least unique for our office. They're things that are, we're starting to see more and more um, around, um, around the province. There's, uh, we're using the, the uh, concrete with recycled glass aggregate, a small portion at the, the front of the, uh, the store. This is the first time that 
WHW is using this, though we know that the, we've seen some examples around the province um, where that this is starting to become more and more common. Um, we're using uh, the uh, installation at the foundation, which we based on the, uh, the thermo mass system here, because uh, we want a nice tight envelope, and of course we're going for um, some energy savings with our, our lead target. Um, there's a free air cooling system for the cool zone refrigeration, so taking advantage of some of our cold winter uh, and climate and environment here for to help refrigerate that cold beer that everybody wants. Um, we have a high efficiency natural gas heating system, and uh, this is actually being built behind the existing store that's pretty much mostly a slope right now, so there's quite a lot of uh, infill work on the civil side of things, and uh, some new interior design features that um, we're look, starting to look at it in the office, some stuff from 3Form and uh, Barisol. Yeah. Um, we kind of, in our office, we have this uh, dual workflow kind of going right now. We're still heavily using SketchUp in the office, and it kind of creates this awkward kind of situation where we're, we're developing two models at the same time. And um, I kind of saw this as a great option to try and work ourselves into a full Revit workflow from the beginning. So um, we get, you know, the owner was used to, we've done projects in the past with them with, in a CAD workflow, so they're very used to seeing the SketchUp models and taking that forward, so we did that in this project. But as we were creating and developing all the components and families for this project, we kind of were trying to think ahead to future projects and using these, you know, trying to just develop one model at a time. So I'll kind of talk about that later as we get into uh, some of the family stuff. Um, Revit has been a huge help for us in a lot, um, we had a lot of project changes on this for a variety of different reasons that Anna's gonna get into right now. But um, that's definitely one of the biggest benefits that we see is the ability to quickly adapt to the owner's requirements and the owner's changes as they show up. Yeah, it's, I'd say that this, this project uh, didn't follow um, quite a streamlined process as far as um, the changes that, went, that it, it went through. Uh, it was originally a different architect that was working on the project, still the same engineering team with Genevar and CBCL. Um, we were brought on to the project and we actually had almost full working drawings complete last year. Um, so there's a few different versions. That was, I guess, our, our first version that we had then realized we didn't need all the extra height back in the warehouse because they decided that they weren't going to do double height uh, stacking for storage. Uh, the NSLC is, a, of course, a, um, a retail um, uh, or retailer that, of course, is, is constantly changing and upgrading their operations and um, marketing as the new product comes on there. So, so uh, if a little bit of time goes by, a lot of things can change. And, of course, they're, they're always working on upgrading their standards and such. So. Then we went, uh, this year we actually, because of um, some certain other project opportunities that came up last year and uh, the, the overall budget, the, this project got moved to this year, uh, we looked at ways to save some money for them. So we brought this all to one roof level. Uh, and then, so that was our third version at the beginning of this year. And then with, with drawings almost complete here, um, took another look at the requirements at, uh, for the cool zone for some of the double height stacking and some occupational health and safety issues and decided that they needed the roof a little bit higher. So that was one of the, one of the times where being able to use Revit when we already had you know, wall sections complete, noted, and, and such, um, definitely saved us a lot of time to make a change like that. And a, cha a change like that was not uh, as intimidating at that phase of the project for us. And then I think that's version five and version six is in the works right now. <laughs> okay. um, one of the real keys to a successful BIM project, um, especially with Revit, is the uh, having a solid library of components. You heard the previous talk they were talking about that uh, as far as detail components go, but we're finding more and more um, the more integrated our projects are, you know, we're still not, we still haven't connected with the contractor in any real fashion, but even just between the different consultants, having geometry that's accurate and um, true, and, you know, we used to do a lot of 2D components on, you know, kind of on the ground, but we were finding that um, when we were modeling them just for our uses, they weren't making, they weren't translating really well to this 
integrated process. So we've been getting more and more detailed with our families to make sure that we can place outlets in the proper location so we can make sure we get the clearances of ducts, make sure that lighting falls in the right location. And that's been a big help. But um, one of the problems with this is keeping these families light and nimble so that way you can still use your project even though you've got all this complex geometry in here. And one of the big keys to that is using the Revit's level of detail. Um, you can see these are some of the same families will switch back really fast. As you uh, switch, you can see a lot of the geometry just gets dumbed down or a whole bunch of pieces that aren't needed in, these, in this coarse view. So when you're orbiting around your model in a coarse view, you can, you can still be nice and nimble with these objects. Um, you can also, we do a lot of, um, you need to make sure that when you build this geometry that it looks good, not only we want to be able to take this into, to use it for a SketchUp kind of purpose in the future. So we need them to look good in a 3D view, but we also need them to function in a 2D environment. And you know, I feel like there is this kind of disconnect with the 3D and the 2D if we could start getting this information of the contractors in a 3D version that will save us a lot of time um, in creating these families to make sure that they look good in our elevation sections and in 3D. Um, one of the key things to worry about is how much information do you put into these models? So this looks, this is a cash station that some of you may be familiar with from NSLC. Um, you'll notice there, there does seem to be a lot of detail in there, but I only take it to the level of detail that we would normally detail in an architectural casework detail. So you won't see any fasteners in here, you won't see any hinges, you won't see all those little tiny objects that, especially new users that we start out with, really, start, really try to focus on because you can. Um, so while all of this stuff looks like it's complicated, it's really simple geometry and just the basic, the bare minimum that we need to have in there. Um, and also the question of parametric, this uh, cache unit kind of is going to change a lot from, uh, from project to project. So I didn't spend a lot of time putting, making any of this parametric. Instead I've gone through and I've nested all of these objects in together so that way I can really quickly adapt this family to meet the needs of the particular project. So I didn't spend time making sure that the whole cache unit can extend out and widen as we need to. I made sure that I could, nim I could be quick and nimble about changing these things in a, on a more complex basis. Um, and you'll see that I spend a lot of time, we spend some time modeling the um, casework as it's actually built. So if there's a piece of blocking in there, it's good to get that stuff in there. And it really helps you figure out what it is that you're actually designing. So you have to think about how this stainless steel wraps around the corner and dies into a particular end. And it seems like a lot of work up front. It really feels, you know, new users who are used to a CAD workflow really feel like they're wasting their time up front. But when you can really quickly go from here to taking that 3D geometry that you've created and just hit print to get some plans, put a little bit of detail work into it, and before you know it, you've thought all this stuff through and the drawings come out in very little amount of time. So it's this upfront cost that we keep on talking about. You have to invest more upfront, and that's you know, where the billing needs to come. Everything kind of shifts forward to really get this stuff thought through before you get on to the next step. We should say to, uh, I'll, just, I'll just mention, we, we collaborated with uh, uh, Millworker, our science consultants, the IT um, group at the NSLC for this unit. Uh, it may not change a lot from project to project, but uh, even like this reissue in here, all of a sudden now the NSLC is offering um, smaller bottles of wine and up, up front as opposed to those little, little tiny guys and such. So those are the kinds of things that have, have made us have to uh, make our families flexible. And when you do 3D model these changes, then when you hit print, all that information is actually in your detail. You don't have to go back to every view and detail them again. And it really does save time in the long run. Um, uh, getting back to some of the other families that we create, we do have some kind of uh, unique Revit families that we've created. Um, this is a, a symbol that we use to kind of keep track of all of the, uh, the issues that we have on a particular project. In an AutoCAD environment, you know, your users all go in cloud, everything that they can find with the revision tool. That becomes an issue in Revit because when you 
add a revision to something, it puts a little checkbox in the dialog box in the uh, title block. So we've come up with this system instead. And using symbols for it is a great thing because you can then go ahead and schedule those symbols. So that way, um, you can in that schedule, you can click on the object you want, hit highlight and model, and then boom, it just takes you to that view. And because it's a symbol, it only exists in one view, and it takes you right there. That's a wonderful thing. So that's you know some of the beauty of searching deep into the internet. You can find a whole bunch of little tips and tricks that really speed along the collaboration process. This has been really successful in our office. All the users come up to me and say that that's the best thing that we've done yet. So this is really the power of BIM right here, and I would love to be able to work this into a contractor or an owner workflow. I could totally see sharing of models with something similar to this process to really speed it along, but we're still working in that. Um, there are several little instances where geometry got more complex than we were ready for at the time. Um, so, you know, you can't be afraid to use all the tools that you have. So this was actually, we had a guy in AutoCAD who could create this nice wave curve form. And you, as you can see, we were able to bring it into the project, no problem, shows nicely in elevation, and really got the point across. Um, I think if we had a little bit more time, we'd find a way to do it all with massing and Revit. But, you know, when you, when you hit constraints, you've got to do what needs to be done. Um, another fun little family, just to kind of point out some of the stuff we do. Um, this is misusing a, a railing tool. This is, again, fun searches on the internet. Um, misusing a railing tool to report out exiting distances. Um, unfortunately, you can't tag the length of a railing family. Not quite sure why. There's always lots of little idiosyncratic things in Rabbit like that. So, I'm kind of pointing out on the side here, someone has to put the same length in the comment section that the, the railing points out. So there still is some manual work through to get all that done. But you know, Revit's all about getting, using these, you know, figuring these small tips and tricks to get, get things really singing. And it ends up working in the long run, as long as everyone pays attention. Um, some of the benefits of actually modeling all of this geometry um, you, you may not notice it right up front, but we were able to use, um, because we spent so much time getting those cash registers, we were able to use them to do a solar study to figure out that early on in the morning there's going to be a lot of glare on the computer screens that they did. So we actually ran a little, and of course this was playing before, but videos never work. Oh, here we go. So you can see that this is 10 a.m. running throughout the year. So the time's always 10 a.m. You can see the the clock scrolling at the top. And you can see that uh, kind of in the winter months, there's a, a lot of glare on those screens. So we um, were able to add blinds, and you guys added some. Yeah, yeah may I'll just talk about some of the, the design implications of, of this. Uh, we were trying to figure out, number one, was our sunshade uh, deep enough to cause or to help with the glare on the computer screens. Uh, once we did this, we, uh, we actually ended up using a, a frosted glazing at the top as a sort of to diffuse some of the light that was coming in. Um, and uh, and um, we also just wanted to see how many, how often during the year are they going to have to physically roll down the blinds. Uh, as many of you know, when you put a blind down, it often doesn't go back up. And, and that's not good when you're a real retailer, retailer and you want people to know that you're open and that there's product in here and, of course, for security issues uh, as well. So uh, we were able to use the solar studies to uh, determine we needed a little bit of a, of a, of a deeper uh, solar shade, and, uh, but, but that we would need to put some roller blinds in it as well in this case. And that was all just, you know, we were able to do this very quickly because we took the time to really think these things through ahead of time. It's, you know, something that's just a byproduct of the model, really. I don't want to do that. I want to go forward. Um, one of the most fantastic things about all the disciplines working together is that we can see everything that everyone's doing all at one time. We can bring all these models into our architectural Revit model where we're already spending all of our time and just see, that, see the things that are there. That also creates an issue where we now see everything that's there. Um, so the families that get created by the different consultants, if they don't match uh, graphic standards that we have or um, you know, the different office standards can, uh, we kind of run into issues between those two things. So I'll let Anna talk a little bit more about this since she actually dealt 
with these things? Well, I should say uh, first that the um, successes as far as coordination far outweighed any of the challenges that we had uh, being able to actually physically see, um, of course, all of the uh, potential interferences uh, with mechanical, um, electrical, structural, and architectural was uh, a huge benefit on this project. And we were really excited. Uh, structural, um, we've been working with in Revit with structural for quite some time now with um, with both CBCL and and some uh, some other consultants uh, in the city um, and uh, and had started working uh, with mechanical uh, on a previous project as well. And of course, now we actually have a few more projects in the office that are full coordination. Uh, but this is the first one that I worked on that was um, full structural, mechanical, um, electrical, civil, architectural. Didn't mm -hmm. leave anybody out there, did I? Um, of course, so, yeah, some of the challenges when we, we uh, got to the end and we were close to our deadline here doing some last minute coordination, um, the sections just didn't, didn't look as um, to, I guess, the architectural standards that we had within the office. So um, I know previously we had done some work uh, with uh, O'Neill Scriven on the, uh, the CBC project and, and we had some time there to do some coordination with uh, the way that they, the graphics uh, at the end, you know, for cutting through a duck. It has the, that, that nice, strong graphic look that we wanted, but that didn't happen at the end of this project, so that's always something to take into consideration. And um, I think there's a bit of a give and the take of whose responsibility that is. I mean, both uh, working with the, um, with, within the consulting team uh, to see if, if the consultants can uh, develop families that are um, a bit more than the generic families, but then also the architectural can lend support, uh, of course, of how they would like the final uh, appearance to look on the drawings. I should say, though, that Jeff's structural line weights are just <laughs> incredible on BIM. That was one of the things that uh, we often get within the office because there's still a lot of CAD users and they're used to seeing, um, and of course, there's been the, the line weight standards and such within CAD have been um, developed over many, many, many years in a, an old office like ours, so people are used to seeing a certain standard, and, and we've got um, a lot of our, our, our Revit uh, standards are now up to par, but. Uh, but uh, every once in a while, there's a few little kinks. And when I saw Jeff's <laughs> structural drawings at first, I got pretty excited because the line weights are just, just bang on crisp. <laughs> yeah, it, um, the structural coordination has been wonderful for a while now. It, it really works. Revit's got that work down really well. And you know, it's this growing pains that we really still have is with the mechanical, electrical. And that's just a fa function of everyone being new at it, everyone. So, um, but the, the power of seeing all of these things in, you know, you take an interior elevation and your outlets are there, it's absolutely amazing. Um, one of the biggest issues that, from a coordination issue in, internally that we have, because we have so many people in our office and only half of them are in, uh, half of them are in the BIM workflow and the other half are still using AutoCAD, we do have um, constant fights in the office. So um, trying to, you know, grab the right people, and then you have these few users who are kind of going across the two platforms and they really get gobbled up really quick. So that's another kind of um, reason why jumping full into BIM, I think, could be, is a much more successful way to do it. If you just, you know, make the decision, the higher ups decide to do it, I think it saves a whole bunch of headaches later on down the road. Um, one of the big, one of the biggest benefits and also the biggest pain in, uh, with this coordination environment is that we are now using geometry directly from these other models. And when that geometry doesn't line up, as you can see here in the bottom left, it can be, you know, we're used to an AutoCAD just moving that object over. We no longer have that power. Um, it really forces the conversation between the consultants to, um, you know, we actually want them to go update their geometry. So instead of just moving it ourselves and saying, oh, we'll figure it out later, now we actually have to call up the consultant on the phone and make sure that they understand what needs to be moved where. And it is blatantly obvious when those things don't line up, which is a, a fantastic thing. But it seems like when you first start that this is, this is no good. We, we've got to figure a way around this. But that causes, that forces coordination. Coordination has to happen. It can't, it's not a side thought anymore. Um, another issue that we run into with every consultant that we do, um, the, I, for some reason, they all like to have these little floating objects out on the side. And there's ways to deal with that. We end up putting it on separate work sets or things, but that's always one of my fun things. We, before we bring in any objects, we always delete the little floating things off on the side. Um, just a little pet peeve. Um, one of the 
biggest challenges with the BIM workflow is going from Civil 3D to Revit. Autodesk does not have that workflow worked out yet. Um, one of our big problems is that they use global coordinates in Civil, which makes tons of sense to me, but Revit has a 20 mile radius. And as you can see, I kind of, the end of this red box kind of shows the point I'm grabbing. That's 5,580 kilometers away, well outside of the 20 mile radius that's in there. Um, and we seem to have a lot of trouble trying to, if we could just pick a work point on the site that we can call 00, zero we can still export it and rev it with that global coordinate, but we do have lots of challenges trying to find that, that base point, and that's something to think about before you start coordinating um, civil. And it's every project we have, it always seems to be a little bit of a fight. I think Autodesk needs to work on that a bit. Um, and this is one of my favorite slides. This is actually right from the architectural model, but showing all the mechanical. And I think the power of that is you know, you can't put that into words when you don't have to go flipping between all these different sheets to make sure that the coordination is actually occurring. I don't have to wonder what height that duct is at. I don't have to wonder if I have the clearance of my ceiling. I can look at it right in the model and see that it's right there. Yeah, I, I found as a project manager on, on, on this project and a relatively uh, a new project manager that being the power of being able to see all of the uh, coordination was is uh, incredibly valuable um, and working, working in Revit. I mean, the true test is gonna be when we build this thing and uh, we're fairly confident uh, that we've worked out quite a lot of uh, the issues um, within interferences and, and such, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about, <laughs> about that kind of an image as, as well. Um, that's our presentation. I hope that we've, uh, I hope that maybe we've been able to give you some ideas of ways to, um, um, you know, help with uh, working with BIM within uh, your own industry and, and presented some challenges that maybe, maybe you guys are sitting out there thinking, oh, well, we have a great way of dealing with that. That's not a challenge at all for us and, and uh, that we can talk about that. Thanks. Uh, Chris Florin again from Serving Dumbrack. Um, we're also a civil engineering shop, so when you talked about the issues you're having with coordinating between the civil work and the architectural work, you just hit me in the biggest sore spot because we're doing laser scanning and civil work and we're trying to, we're fighting with ourselves. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little more specifically about how you're handling the coordination of some of those products or if you're, if it's always a stumbling block each time or. Um, it seems like I, just as I get it all figured out, I get a different site in and I realize that I really, I still don't understand it. Okay, they, that's they, where I'm at. Yeah, <laughs> shared coordinates and Revit are, I've, I've taught lunch and learns on it. I've, you know, thought that I was fully engrossed and then I get on another yeah. project and it, it stumps me again. Okay, um, also bringing in those tins, we seem to do a little better job with um, using contours instead of tins and really getting the detail really fine. But Revit doesn't do a good job yet. The topography tools in Revit are lackluster. We've had some success with um, coming up with a common point for translation, but then there's a rotation component that always seems to break down between yeah. project north of you know the architectural stuff, the MEP stuff, yeah. and real e north or whatever. So Even working with Genovar, yeah. who were part of the Genovar family, yeah. we still can't get that okay. project, coordinate, you know, project coordinate worked out. Great presentation. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned the lead. Um, yes. Could you just speak briefly to um, energy modeling and um, how you guys handle that? I mean, since you have the all of this modeled, uh, do you do it uh, yourselves? Does your mechanical we, consultant? We don't. We always out, we yeah. outsource all of it. Um, I thought that we had, when I did the initial talk workup on this, I thought that we had done lead documentation for this project, but we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, some of the other projects, uh, it's really helped us, especially with like daylight and views and mm -hmm. all of those other, having that 3D model to really pull the information from. We tend to have a little bit of a different team do the lead documentation mm -hmm. and the dialogue between the two is greatly eased by having all of this geometry and 3D so they can really understand the building as soon as they get in. It has um, the energy modeling process, uh, has it influenced the way that you go about building the Revit model? Is there something, you know, whether it's normals to surfaces, or is there something that you need to consider when you're, when you're developing that model? Um, we haven't, we've been using some of the Vasari 
features yeah. to kind of influence our pre-design on some of these things. Um, things like this building was very set based on the you know, layout of the site and everything. We were very stuck with what we had. Yeah. But on some of the larger buildings we've been doing, we've been using some of these preliminary tools to you know, figure out the difference between variations of projects, not to get accurate numbers, right. but we're still, ha it hasn't really changed the way that we um, do the energy analysis at all, okay. unfortunately. I think there's so much potential there for that to be done, but it's a break in the workflow, definitely. Okay. Jeff Axel from CBCL, just to expand on this, we were the structural mechanic electrical uh, engineers on this project, and our mechanical electrical engineers like to get involved in the projects really up front. And they do do their energy, energy analysis on the building. And they'll play with the envelopes and that and try to assist Anna and, and Mike on these type of things. Um, and they are now linking the Revit to their HAP software and the different things like that. So um, it's a great tool in that sense. And like you say, we're all finding the same thing is with the BIM process and 3D modeling, we, we want to do so much more work up front to help create the building and have more say in it. So, that's with, we're all talking about the billing today and, and how this thing wants to creep forward. And, and I agree 100% that uh, that should happen that way in that extent. But that's how we as engineers try to assist the architects in, in, in trying to do that. So. And it is a pleasure working with them in, in this 3D environment. It really is. I can't say enough about it. And especially when these changes come up and it makes it so easy to, for everyone on the job to figure out what, what the changes actually happen. Hi, Tom Vincent again. Um, I was just curious, um, you see a lot of drawings that uh, when they go for tender package, what, how are you going to get this information to the actual trade who's going to save you the money to, because it's all coordinated? Typically, we'll see a tender package, that, although it may be in Revit, it looks like a 2D drawing. Um, so when you're looking at it from a, a trade perspective, you have no idea whether the elevations are correct or not correct whether the offsets are shown, that sort of thing. And just try, if you want the impact from the trades, because it's coordinated, how do you communicate that information down to that level? I am, you know, I, I love to share the knowledge. I think that the, the future of this is definitely sharing those models. And I feel like there is a, a definite disconnect between the way we um, produce doc these 2D documents off of this 3D geometry that we create. I feel like we waste, it, it's just a waste of time trying to get this information that we could be giving, just sharing. And so um, there's definitely, you know, we're, we're all a little gun shy about the legal aspects of all this stuff. I know in our office we definitely are you know, uh, timid to, to share this stuff. And we really haven't been asked very often for the, we get asked for AutoCAD exports of the Revit model all the time, which is still more part of the um, regular workflow. But as DSRA has been asked before, we haven't yet been approached to share our Revit model with a, with a contract, and we'd love to figure out the details of all that stuff, but I do think there is some struggle. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I've actually only ever been asked for um, that funny sail shape that you guys saw right there the other day, um, actually, for, for, uh, for pricing. So, so uh, that's uh, the first time I saw it, but uh, I agree, we're, we're not there yet. That's a great opportunity. That's one of the, the great things. Um, I think in the, the original presentation there was uh, some talk about uh, uh, BIM Council looking into owner ownership, of course, of, of models, and we as our, our firm are, are looking into that those kinds of things as, as well, but we're going to have to break, to break that down and, and really uh, use this to its full, full capacity. Hi, Peter Sardi with Defence Construction Canada. Uh, and I just wonder, you mentioned some about spending the extra time at the front end to develop the model and how that saves so much time when the owner makes changes late in the game. And where you've done a number of these stores that way, if, if you're seeing any trends on how much time is saved, whether, how that might affect the cost of delivery and savings that could be passed back to the owner, or um, if, if there's any kind of stats you've developed internally on how much is being saved by going with, a, with the BIM method. Uh, this is our, I guess this would be our second NSLC store doing it in okay. Revit and our first one okay. full integration. So uh, okay. we definitely did a lot of the upfront work on this project as well. Um, I think one thing that it does, is it's some, it often, or I've, I'm finding on some of the other projects we do, it changes uh, 
the pre-design, schematic design, design development, construction documents percentages. Once we're done design development, we, we're for, pretty far into construction documents with the, the BIM process, um, which may, maybe isn't changing the overall time when we're not um, doing some of these repeat families and such, but definitely is changing um, the uh, kind of the, the, the project uh, procedures. Uh, on this project, like, like Mike did a lot of upfront work on these families and, and uh, assuming that, that we keep building these and WHW is still involved in these projects, uh, we should be able to you know, develop some of these drawings much quicker in the next time around. We're very confident that's what happened. We have, um, we've done a few just uh, renovations on the cool zones in a lot of, the, uh, in a lot of NSLCs um, going past and we were able to use all these families and take them right in there and those actually went pretty quickly but they were such small projects that they kind of fell off everyone's radar. I don't think we really think about them too often because they, they just went smooth and quick and uh, no, out the door. That's, that's a good point actually. I think we did about seven or eight cool zone renovations where we probably would have spent a uh, few weeks on the on the first one, um, and then now we could pretty much do a full cool zone. I mean, once we've once we've done our uh, site measurements and analysis, we can put out the drawings for those in maybe two or three days. So, I mean, it's not a very big space; they're only you know 2,500 square feet or something like that. But um, uh, there's um, a lot of coordination and uh, and families and drawings that are are pretty quickly done with Revit. But no hard numbers. Yeah, no hard numbers. Question. And we're working with you on a EADM facility for D&D, yes. which all of it has been done in BIM, and we have shared all of the 3D models with the subcontractors for pricing. Oh. You involved in that? that yeah, yeah I, I, I felt like, gotcha. So I didn't know, I, um, I know that we got asked in the beginning, the initial stage of that whole project for a lot of, for, um, a lot of CAD going out and in with it. I, so I, I apologize, yeah, I wasn't aware that. I guess right now we're at the stage we'll do it with a design build for the contractor right. and the engineer and architect are working. Right and that is the constructability, but for design bid build, we have not released the 3D models for the different structures. Yeah, we would love to do a, a case study on that project, but so we have that one day. Bid. Yeah, and it's it's a fantastic process when everyone's on board. It really saves so much time. Thank <laughs> you.